Good morning. So we will be starting in around uh, five minutes. Okay, good morning. So let's start the class. So today we will run through a very quick summary of uh, what we try to study in this week. And then uh, the problems there are really challenging. So so today we won't be going through 
uh, many pages of the slides, just roughly 14 pages, but then the questions that we are looking at are really difficult, some of them. So let's start with this one. So, so we have n people, and then they want to stand to form a ring. And then we want to find out how many ways, how many different ways can they stand so that, uh, so that, uh, yeah, we will consider what? We will consider two arrangements are the same if one can change it to the other by doing the cyclic shifting. So in the example here, we, we see that there are three people, but then we will consider these two configurations are the same because for, let's say this is one. So on the left side of one is three, on the right side of one is two. So similarly for this one, on the left hand side of one, so if you face, face, let's say people are all facing at the center, on the left hand side of one will be three, just like this case, and the right hand side of one is two. So we will see that this configuration is the same as this configuration. We will count them as the same. So how many ways are there? So there are, so, so that, so, so after some uh, easy uh, counting, we will find that. So it really depends on n. The answer is we get n minus one first and then take the factorial of it. So the answer is n minus one factorial. So we can have two different interpretation. One, the first interpretation is, so because in any case, there must be a one there. So we can use one as the marker and then we want to list out all the people one by one that is going to stand on the left hand side of of the next one. So the so so on the left hand side of one it could be three, it could be two. So there are two choice, and after that there's one choice. So there's two factorial here for three people. When there are n people, so there's n minus one choice, n minus two choice, n minus three choice, and so on and so forth, up to one choice. So you can actually imagine that this is the same problem as as so if this is the case then the standing is not like in a circle but we start from one and then we are asking how many ways the remaining n minus one people can stand on the line so in that case it is n minus one factorial so you can also have the other way of doing the interpretation so so let's add the people one by one so so according to the label so we add the people one here first on the range so there's one place that it can be placed when we add the the two, so there's only one place that it can be placed because yeah, because we are saying that no matter what it is placed, one and two will have always get the same configuration after cyclic shift. But then after that, the 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 next person there are two locations that it can it can it can stand, and then after there are three locations and so on and so forth. So the number of ways that people can stand will be one times one times two times three and so on and so forth. And the last one is n minus one. So again, we get n minus one factorial. So my emphasize is that uh, for the same problem, there can be different interpretations. There is there is no standard answer as long as you get the correct way of counting, then it is perfect. Okay. So let's look uh, again at the next example. So in this example, so so we have assumed that there are n objects, but then these n objects they are not all distinct. So we will say q one of them are of the same kind of the first kind. Let's say q one of them are red, q two of them are yellow blah 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 up to qt of them let's say they are black so how many ways that we can arrange these n objects so red objects are all considered to be the same yellow objects are all considered to be the same and so on and so forth so how many ways are there so the number of ways that we can arrange these objects so we call this an n permutation because we are going to use all the objects in the arrangement so n objects in total and then we are going to use all of them so it is n permutation that we are asking so it will be n factorial divided by q1 factorial, q2 factorial up to qt factorial. So a very rough explanation is something like this. So we will say, so suppose that originally all the objects are the same. Uh, sorry, all the objects are different. They are distinct. So in that case, there will be n factorial ways of arrangements. But let's say suddenly q1 of them turns to be the same kind. So in that case, we don't have as many choices as we have. So in that, because Q1 of them 
are considered to be the same. So any arrangement of them, of these objects, will be considered, any different arrangement of these objects originally will now be considered to be the same because they are now changing to the same color. So in that case, we need to divide the original n factorial by the number of ways that we can arrange these objects internally. And then it is q1 factorial. So we will divide it by q1 factorial. And after that, suddenly, q2 of them turns into another color. They are into the same color. Then in that case, we need to divide again q2 factorial and so on and so forth. So 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 we get this result. So if you want to... Yeah, so I, I believe that uh, if you have studied uh, this combinatorics in your high school, you must have you must have come across this expression before. Okay, so let's see an example. So in this example, suppose that we have five dashes and eight dots, and then we want to find out how many ways we can arrange them. So the total number of ways that we can arrange them is because there are 13 objects in total, so we will start with 13 factorial. But then 5 of them are the same, so we need to divide it by 5 factorial. And then 8 of the remaining, they are all the same, so we would need to divide it by 8 factorial. So this is the number of ways that we can arrange them. So the dots and the dashes are used in sending Morse codes. Okay, so uh, in yeah, it is still used nowadays uh, for ships. Okay. So dashes means it is a long pause, a long signal. Dot dot is a short signal. Okay. Now let's consider a slightly more complicated example. So in this case, we will assume that we are still using five dashes and eight dots. But then, in each message that we are trying to send, we can only allow seven symbols. So we have a fixed length message each time we are sending seven symbols. Let's say it could be five dash followed by two dots. So this is one possible signal. Or we may be sending seven dots. This is another one. Or maybe we are sending a dot and then five dash and a dot. So this could be a different message. Is that okay? So we want to find out how many different kinds of messages we can send. So for this one, there is no single formula to compute this. But then again, we don't need to solve this by using a single formula. We can use rule of thumb and rule of products to help us. So rule of thumb, we can classify the different kind of messages by counting how many how many dashes that we are using. So up to seven symbols, we could be using five dashes, we could be using four dashes, we could be using three dashes, we could be using two dashes, and we could be using one dashes. And we can also be using no dashes. So these are all the cases that we can have. So when we have five dashes, then we must have exactly two dots because we have seven symbols in total. So the number of these kind of arrangements will be, so seven symbols in total, seven factorial, and then we need to divide it by five factorial, two factorial. Okay, so this is corresponding to the number of messages that we have exactly five dashes and two dots. And similarly, this part, corresponds to the number of messages that has exactly four dashes and three dots, and this one exactly three dashes, four dots, exactly two dashes, five dots, exactly one dash and six dots, and finally, exactly seven dots. So, so once you can list out this formula, then we get the result. So the final answer, 120, is not important. The most important thing here is that you can help us to list out this formula and then explain why it is correct. So this is rule of sum. And then for this one, this is the formula that we have just used before. Now the next one, the next one is super interesting. So if you have not viewed the OCW recording or, or okay, yeah, then, and, and then please try, okay, at home, yeah, cover up uh, again and see if you can find out the answer for this one. Now, here it says that, let's consider two number. So the first number is, uh, let's say k is a certain integer, okay, any integer, a positive integer, okay. So let's create this number. So we start by k, making the factorial of k, and then making the factorial of that way. So we get k factorial factorial. And then we can have another number, k factorial to the power k minus 1 factorial. So we want to show that this number 
is not only always larger than or equal to this number, but it is divisible by this one. So let's use a particular example. Let's fit in some value of k. So what do we have? So let's say k is equal to 4. So this number will be 4 factorials factorial. So this number will be, so 4 factorial is 24. So this number will correspond to 24th factorial. Okay. And then this one is 4 factorials, 3 factorial. So it is 24 to the power 3 factorial. 3 factorial is 6. So, so this number is 24 times 24 times 24 up to 6 times. Okay. So we have these two large numbers. The first one is 24 factorial, but the other one is 24 to the power 6. Now, it is rather difficult just to compare which number is larger than the other. And also, it is even more difficult, right, to, to see that, okay, this number is always can, can help to divide this number properly. So how can we show this? So when we have met a kind of questions like this, our experience will usually tell us that, oh, there is a K there. So let's try to use induction maybe. Yeah, because we may be helping uh, we may be solving this just by using induction, but it turns out that induction doesn't help us here a lot. It is rather, rather, uh, okay, I don't find an induction proof for this particular problem. And on the other hand, oh, because it is k factorial or k minus 1 factorial, something like this, we actually know the formula for k factorial and also k minus 1 factorial. So we can try to expand it and then see if we can do the cancelling of the terms one by one. But again, it is very, very difficult. I also don't find a proof that goes on like this. But the good thing here is that, okay, good thing here is that if you have come across these kind of problems before, so we can usually use a combinatorial proof for helping us to, 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 to get a result. So first of all, before we, we look at this number and this number, so let's take a look of of another another an, another expression. So I have another expression. Let me write it down for you. So let me get a, uh, let me see. Let me start with the PowerPoint. Okay, A. Okay, so let's make it blank. Let's make it blank. Ah, let's insert a new slide. Okay, so what I need is the text part. Okay, so. Let's consider this number. Let's consider this very large number. Hey, can you see this clearly? So I'm changing my slides, but then is YouTube moving? Hello, uh, if you are still with me, could you please type a one in the message box so that I can, I can notice my voice is still going on. Hello, am I still with you? <laughs> okay. Okay, so so perhaps there is a very long lagging of what is going on. So so I okay, so let me still continue. Okay. Okay, so so let's consider let's check a look, take a look of this number. This is 100 factorial. And then when I try to divide this, okay, oh maybe I will use just the simple divide this. Divide this by this number, 50 factorial, 20 factorial, 5 factorial, 3 factorial. What do we know? Can we... So we have this very, very large number here, right? So let's make it even larger. So we have this number here. So, so, can we, so we can deduce that. So although we don't have any calculation before, we can still easily deduce that this num this is going to be a whole number. This is going to be an integer rather than a fraction. The reason is that this corresponds to the number of ways of arranging 100 items where 50 of them are of the same type. Let's say 50 of them are red, 20 of them are yellow, 5 of them are green, 
three of them are blue and all the others, they are distinct. They are of all distinct colors. So how many ways are there that we can arrange these 100 objects? So the num so this is this number that we have just that we have just uh, solved. So in that sense, we know that okay, so in that sense we know that this has to be an integer because we count the number of ways. There is no 0 0.5 ways of doing things, right? It must be either one way, two ways, three ways, four ways. It must be a positive or a non-negative integer number of ways of doing so. Okay. Now if we change this slightly, how about this one? So if I change it to 24, and then 4 factorial, 4 factorial, 4 factorial, 4 factorial, 4 factorial, 4 factorial, then this is also uh, going to be a whole number, an integer. The reason is that 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 4, plus 4 it is less than or equal to 24. So in that case, this corresponds to the number of ways of arranging 24 items, where four of them are red, four of them are yellow, four of them are green, four of them are blue, four of them are black, four of them are white, something like this. Okay, so how about this one? So instead of making 24, let's assume that this is k factorial, and then we have k, we have k here, and so on and so forth, up to the last one. This is also k. As long as, as long as these k's adds up to less than or equal to k factorial, this will be a whole number. And this is how we can prove the results in the lecture notes. Okay, so, so this is the basic idea. So combinatorial proof usually is very useful, okay, because it avoids a lot of complicated uh, computation. Okay, now the next one. The next one is also an easy case that we can analyze. So here, suppose that we have n distinct objects, and then each of them, they have unlimited supply. So the number of ways to arrange our objects, so we have, we need to pick our objects out of them. And then for each object, there are n possible cases that we can, we can use because because there is no limitation. So we can choose any one of the objects for the first object, and then there is no restriction so that we can still choose any of the n objects as the second object, and so on and so forth. So if the total is r, so we want to get the r permutation in this scenario, this will be n to the power r, because n choice, n choice, n choice, and so on and so forth. So by rule of product, we get n to the power r. So this is fairly simple, right? Okay. Okay, so if we know this, so let's consider this case. So let's, as, let's consider the numbers between 1 and 10 to the power 10. And then this is the original problem. We want to ask how many of them contain the digit 1 inside. So 1 has a 1, 13 has a 1 because 13 is 1, 3. So it has a 1. 100 has a 1 because it has a 1 inside, 1, 0, 0. So there's a 1 inside. So how many of them contains the digit 1. But then, if you try to solve this directly, yeah, it is not the smartest way of doing so. Yeah, better way is, we try to find out how many of them, how many of them do not contain the digit 1. Now, how, how can we do so? Okay, so this problem is a little bit tricky. We start from looking at the number 1 to 10 to the power 10. Let's change it slightly. Okay, instead of considering the numbers between 1 to 10 to the power 10, we consider the numbers between 0, the integers 0, to 10 to the power 10 minus 1. So that is 9999, Okay, so 10 to the power 10 minus 1 is, there, there is going to be 9 digits of 9. Is that okay? Ah, sorry, 10 digits of 9, sorry. 9999, Okay, so... So how can this help us? Okay, now because we are looking at the cases for containing the digits one, so we can we 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 can do what? We can change the representation of each number to make it into a ten-digit number. 
So zero is now not just zero, but we have zero 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 up to so there are ten of them. So we will fit. So we will make each number into a ten digit number by adding zeros in front of it, so that we make it into ten digits. So in that sense, counting the number of numbers that doesn't contain one will be the same in the original case from when we count from zero to nine 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 nine, and in this new case when we count from zero 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 up to nine 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 nine. Okay, and then if we cannot so. So we are always looking at a string. So this is going to be a string of length 10. There are 10 digit string where each digit you can choose from 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 9. So there are altogether how many strings are there? There are 10 to the power 10 because there are 10 choices for each position. And then how many of them do not contain 1? So there are 9 to the power 10 of them because for each particular position, we have only 9 choices. So how many of them will contain 1? So it is going to be the complement. So it is like 10 to the power 10 minus 9 to the power 10. But then, yeah, but then, but then, yeah. So this is not counting exactly what we are doing here because uh, we are counting numbers between 1 to 10 to the power 10 rather than 0 to 10 to the power 10 minus 1. So after careful uh, manipulations, we will get the result that we want. But this is the idea. So we are going to look at each number as the 10 digit number instead. Okay, so go home and practice. Try 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 your best. Okay. Now the next one is super challenging. Okay. So it really takes time to, to find out even the answer of a particular case. Okay. So here in the first example, we want to count how many binary strings are there with n digits. So easy, 2 to the power n. But then up for all these binary strings, how many of them contain even number of zeros? Okay, so we can try to do work this out by by okay trying the case where n is equal to one, n is equal to two, and so on and so forth, and then and then somehow, incidentally, we will find that exactly half of them contains even number of zeros, and half of them contains even an uh, odd number of zeros. Okay, so why is it true? Okay, so here we, we, we say that the answer is half of them. And then the proof is actually by symmetry. So what kind of symmetry is that? So a clever way, a very clever way is we, we isolate one of the digits, let's say the last digit. Okay, the last digit could be a zero, it could be a one, right? Okay, but then we will see that, let's say, when we fix the first n minus one digits, then after appending a zero and after appending a one, one of them will have even number of zeros and one of them will have odd number of zeros. So we we will be able to see that the number of strings with even number of zeros will be the same as the number of strings with odd number of zeros. Yeah, because of this kind of symmetry. So in that sense, yeah, we can solve this problem easily. Half of them. Yeah, don't worry if you are, if you don't understand now. Yeah, I recommend you to. So if you, yeah, you can do what you can start with this idea, and see if you can get the answer. If you have not seen the OCW recording, on the other hand, if you have checked the OCW recording, so this will be just a quick summary, and see if you can reproduce this kind of smart proof by yourself now. Okay, now the, the other example is extremely hard, I would say. So here we are, this time we consider n digit quaternary strings. So here each, so there are m, so for each string that we consider, there are n positions. And then for each position, it can be either a 0, 1, 2, or 3. So it is quaternary means 4, okay, binary means 2. So it is a uh, a string such that the characters that we can choose is 0, 1, 2, 3, these, these four different types. And we ask the same question. So how many of them contains even number of zeros? So, so it turns out that this is the answer. If you want to know how to get this answer, yeah, go to check the OCW recording. So, so again, yeah, 
this is hard to argue this combinatorially. But later we will talk about uh, some related uh, concepts uh, in the next uh, topic. So we are talking about permutations and combinations now. But later we will talk about generating functions, and then and then later. After that, we will talk about recurrence relation. So with more knowledge about these new topics, we will be able to solve this problem easily, mechanically, just yeah, without any, any thinking. Yeah, we can solve this straightforward, just like solving a, just like solving a, finding the rules of a quadratic equation. That, that is something like this. We do mechanical things. Okay. So we will talk about this later. But meanwhile, see if you can get a combinatorial proof. So to argue why this is a correct answer. Okay, now, so we, okay, combinations. Okay, so so far we are talking about arrangements of objects, but then combinations is about selections of objects. Previously, we have established this identity. So P and R is always equal. So I should use the equivalent notation here. It is always have the same value as PRL and multiplied with CNR. Okay, so because I want to pick R objects out of N objects and make arrangement, so what I do here is that I select the R objects and then after that I do the arrangement. So this is what we can do. So rule of product gives us the, this identity. Now we have the formula for PNL, we have the formula for PRL, so that's by doing algebra, we get the formula for CNR. So CNR is PNR divided by PRR, so it is n factorial divide, uh, divided by n minus r factorial and also r factorial. So if you look at this form, by so it is symmetric. Symmetric. If we replace r with n minus r, we get the same result. So immediately we will have this result. But previously, in the last tutorial, we see that this must be true because selecting R objects to keep is the same as selecting N minus R objects to discard. So they must have the same value here. Now, this is a very challenging problem. So here we consider this. So here, in this example, we have a pentagon. But later, we want to ask what happens if we are looking at a Dec decagon, a ten-sided polygon. Okay, so so we so here we start with a polygon, and then we assume that so let's say this let's use this as an example. We have a pentagon here, a five-sided polygon here. So so we draw the diagonals. So we have a di diagonals here, and we assume that so two diagonals may cross at a certain point. So these two diagonals may cross at this point. Okay, so that it can be crossing at the external vertex or internally have an intersection. But then we assume that any three diagonals do not meet at one point. So the polygon is not very regular. So we can twist it a little bit so that we can avoid three diagonals meeting at the same point. Now, given such a scenario, we want to find how many line segments are the diagonals divided by these intersections? So if you look at this pentagon, so there are five diagonals, and then we have intersection, 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 intersection. So there are five intersections here. So this diagonal is divided into three line segments, one, and then two, and then three. And this diagonal is also divided into three segments, one, two, and three. So in this case, we want to ask, given a particular polygon, and we draw the diagonals in this way, so how many, finally, how many line segments are they formed? So here, for the pentagon case, there are going to be 15 line segments. Now to solve this problem, so, so here, so we want to ask, what happens if we are looking at the 10-sided polygon? So to solve this problem, so I'll give you some hints here. The idea here is that, so first of all, we can find out how many diagonals are there. Yeah, it's easy. So to get a diagonal, yeah, to get a diagonal, we must be selecting two vertices, but they are not adjacent to each other. They are not next to each other. So the number of ways to, to do this, 
to select two vertices is let's say we have n sided polygon so there are n choose two ways of selecting two vertices but we won't we don't want them to be adjacent so we need to deduct n of them so it is n choose two minus n and after that we can calculate how many intersections can these diagonals form so so this is the part that we can easily make mistake okay so some some of us may, may say oh two diagonals will form an intersection so in that case in that case let's because let's say there are d diagonals so it will be d choose two but it's not true because let's say this diagonal and this diagonal they do not form an intersection internally and if you look at a hexagon six-sided polygon you will see that some diagonals could be parallel to each other so that they do not form any intersection at all so in that case d choose 2 where d is the number of diagonals is not a correct answer now the number of intersections turns out to be it is going to be n choose 4 for any four vertices that we can select there will be correspondingly two crossing diagonals so there will be one intersection based on it so it is going to be n choose 4 and now we can compute how many diagonals are there how many intersections are there and then based on these two numbers we can find out how many line segments they will be forming so so yeah go home and think about this okay and then another combination problem so here this combination problem is let's look at this problem so there are five pirates they have a treasure box and then they want to keep keep the treasure box in a locked room so that all the locks can be opened if and only if more than half okay at least three or more pirates are present so how can they do so and how many locks are needed okay so so here this is a questions that we have five pirates so as usual when we have a problem like this let's try to make it simpler so what about the cases where we have three pirates so let's say we have three pirates and then we have a treasure locked in a room and then this room we have locks okay and then we want the room can be only opened when two of the pirates are there so if just one pirate we don't have the way to open the the doors yeah because the door has a lot of locks okay and then they don't have all the keys but any two of them they should be able to open the the, the door so how can we do so 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 we can do a scheme something like this so suppose that we have three locks on the doors on the door so let's say the locks are called a b c so the first pirate keeps the key of a b the second pirate keeps the keys for b c and the third one keep keeps the keys for c and a okay then in that case we can check that check that any one single pirate cannot open the door because they have just two keys they must have missing keys to some of the locks so so one pirate can open but any two pirates they they will be able to to open it because the the second one will have a key the that is required by the first one that 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 he doesn't have so in that case when we have three pirates this problem we will need three locks and then each one possesses two keys okay to two different locks okay but how do we extend this to the case where we have five pirates so yeah so so in the lecture we talk about something a little bit different so we we change it to the problem of star war but they are essentially the same problem so see if you can solve this and then this is the final slide for today let me double check yeah it, it should be right yeah this is the final slide for today so here this is a simple problem so so here how many ways can we select three numbers from 1 to 300 such that the sum is divisible by 3 now this problem is about divisibility by 3 so so we can naturally classify the numbers into three groups the first group are those numbers that are multiples of 3 like 3 6 9 and so on and so forth the second group is containing those numbers that is multiple of 3 and then plus 1 so it is like 1 4 7 10 and so on and so forth and the third group are those numbers that are 2 plus multiple of 
3. So we, we have 2, 5, 8, 11, and so on and so forth. Now, the way that we classify the numbers into these groups, because for the, for the numbers in the same group, they have the same property up to divisibility by 3. Okay. Now, in that sense, we can simplify this problem a lot. So in order to get three numbers such that the sum is divisible by three, we may be choosing three numbers from the same group. So this is one possible way. Or we may be choosing exactly one number from each group. Now, if this is the case, then we can do simple counting. Okay, so suppose that we are choosing three numbers from group zero. Let's say zero means that the group that has all all the numbers with 0 plus multiple of 3, so they are multiples of 3. So by choosing 3 numbers from group 0, so, so we get a way, okay, so how many ways are there? There are 100 numbers there, and we need to pick 3 of them, so 100 choose 3. So another way is we can pick any 3 numbers from group 1, okay, group 1 contains those numbers which are 1 plus multiple of 3, so, so they are all also, the same number, 100 choose 3 ways of doing so. And similarly, we can choose 3 numbers from the remaining group, group 2. So, how many ways are there? 100 choose 3. And finally, the last way is, we can pick 1 number from each group. So, it is going to be 100 times 100 times 100 ways of doing so. So, that's why we get the answer. Now, to make sure you understand this problem, completely, you can change the numbers a little bit. So, for instance, what happened if I change the, the something like this? How many ways can we see that three numbers from 1 to 300 such that their sum is divisible by 4? Or when the sum is divisible by 7, something like this. Okay, oh, okay, 7 is too large. Okay, but let's say 4. Maybe this is not going to be a number divisible by 3. So, for instance, how many ways can we see that three numbers such that they are from 1, 2, up to 200 only, okay? And then the sum is divisible by 3. So how many ways can we do so? Or we can change this value a little bit. So instead of selecting 3 numbers, how many ways can we select 4 numbers such that they are divisible by 3, something like this. So when you change this into different variations and you can still solve the problem correctly, then you are done with this problem. Okay, so I think that's all for today. Yeah, sorry for being super fast and then yeah so if you are okay with a particular part yeah you can skip the ocw recording and on the other hand if you need more details or the hints or whatever yeah go back and see the ocw recording so again we will collect your questions uh, uh up to saturday and then we will talk about this uh during the tutorial next tuesday okay that's all for today yeah thank you very much Okay, so let me stop.